much. So I hope everyone can hear me. If not, I can talk really loud. Um, so this talk's going to be a little different than what you've heard before. Um, I'm going to present some good news and some bad news. So I'm going to start off with some bad news, and that has to do with the persistence of these bacteria in the environment. And the good news is that we have some tools now that we think we can use to look at microorganisms in their entirety in the environment and try to get an understanding of where they come from. So, um, of course, these bacteria represent the most exceeded water quality standard we have. We've heard this morning about Enterococci and E. coli. Um, and we know that the environment does fairly well at ridding itself of bacteria that leak into the environment, especially from small farm systems or privies. But, of course, this doesn't work well, um, especially when the loads are large. <coughs> and die off of these bacteria can occur, mostly due to UV light and also to starvation. However, uh, these bacteria are clever or cheeky, as we might say, because given enough numbers and selection pressure, and in this case the pressure is death, um, there's alternate host and reservoirs for these bacteria, and it becomes a strategy for their growth in the environment. So of course, as you've heard this morning and this afternoon, the hope for the future and the present, of course, is that we can use MST tools to kind of follow these organisms in the environment. And this is really necessary to use these tools because the bacteria differ by relatively small amounts of DNA. Um, and their major difference is that they live in different um, environments. So um, there's been a lot of methods about uh, which organisms we can uh, look at and which methods we can use, and also to find out how long these bacteria persist. So um, you've heard a lot of these methods today, and I'm just going to focus on one that my lab's been working on, um, gosh, it must be about 15, 20 years now, and that's RET-PCR DNA fingerprinting. And we use this technology because it's rapid, so we can process 400 organisms a week using this technology. And we're using the technology not so much for source tracking like Don presented before, but as a means to follow the organisms in the environment, just like you do in an epidemiological study. So this allows us to look at organisms as populations and follow the population changes over time. So the question we had, of course, was can these fingerprinting technologies identify diversity and the ecology of the fecal contamination in watersheds? And just to get quick show you what this DNA fingerprinting technology looks like, um, it exploits the presence of these repetitive elements that are in every organism's genomes from yours to a lonely bacteria. And my laboratory uses a different uh, primer set than is used here in Texas. We use the box PCR fingerprinting. And you get a lot of bands on these gels. And these bacterial barcodes can be scanned using various tools and technologies to provide an exact identification for a particular bacterial strain. Um, so these types of tools really provide the background for us to ask the important questions to ask what are the sources and sinks of these bacteria in the environment. And to understand that, we really understand, need to understand their ecology. So this gets back to basics of microbial ecology. So we know now that despite what you've learned in microbiology classes, there are many sources and sinks of fecal bacteria in the environment, and E. coli is not limited to the intestinal tract of warm-blooded animals. That's the bad news, okay? Now these studies really came out of initial work that was done by Roger Fujioka and his colleagues, uh, Murali Bayapanahali and others at the University of Hawaii, who were in fact trying to find a site that they can use as a control that had no E. coli in it. And they could not find one. Including digging up the lawn on the front of the campus, they found E. coli in the soil. They also followed up those studies in Guam and Puerto Rico, and there's been some further follow-ups in, in Florida. And we just asked the question, can you also find E. coli in soils in temperate climates and really nasty temperate climates like those we have up in Minnesota? Right? So we started to do our studies on this beautiful lake. This is Lake Superior, which is two hours and 15 minutes from our campus. And this is the Duluth Superior Harbor right here. And our sites are scattered around uh, the Lake Superior Harbor, adjacent to some streams and rivers that bring water into the lake. And we simply asked the question, can these organisms be found in these soils? Now, for those who have worked on soils before, it's great when you do them in summer, but if you have to study soils in winter, it makes a whole new problem. 
and we found the best tool for sampling soils in winter is a chainsaw. Okay. <laughs> right. So essentially you take a chainsaw and you can dig out big hunks of soil and bring it back to the lab and thaw it and then look for microbes in those environments. So we've done that over several different years and we find that the numbers of E. coli present in soils drop over the season down to anywhere from three to five microbes per gram of soil. And when the soil heats up in the summer, those organisms and populations increases in size to 10 to the two to 10 to the three per gram of soil. Now, our main interest is what are these soil E. coli and are they different from those that might be coming from animals? And like those here, we have a library and we've created DNA fingerprint libraries from organisms surrounding Lake Superior. And those organisms mostly include deer, geese, and gulls and terns. And the soil E. coli are genotypically different than those that we find in these other animals. The good news is, despite the fact that these organisms are in the soil, they only represent approximately 19% of that we find in the waterways. So we have DNA probes and we can actually follow these organisms off the soil during rainfall events making their way into the waterway. The other interesting part of the study is that some of the organisms we find repeatedly at the same site are genetically identical. These organisms grow, die, survive, and regrow over and over again over multiple years. And since we're not sure where these organisms came from, we call these naturalized E. coli, rather than indigenous to these soils. So now the question I'm sure you're all asking is, where do these E. coli come from? And I'm sorry to say I have no answer for that. It's a chicken and egg question. <laughs> but just remember that E. coli was on this planet many hundreds of millions of years before we came around. Okay? And it will likely be here hundreds of millions of years after we're gone. So where this organism came from, I don't know. It could have been deposited by a warm-blooded animal or even a cold-blooded animal and survived and reproduced in the soil. Or it could have been in the soil to begin with and then later maybe can become adapted to a mammal. I just have no answer for that right now. In addition to soils, we're also interested in sand and sediments. And these are some collaborations I've done with Winfred Soule and Randall Hicks at the University of Minnesota Duluth. And we were working at a site called the Duluth Boat Club. Don't get excited. Wait till I show you what this boat club looks like. Okay? So, um, so this is an interesting story. So this is WLSD. This is the Western Lake Superior Sanitary District. There's two sewage treatment facilities in Lake Superior Harbor. One from the city of Duluth and one from the sister city of Superior, Wisconsin. Okay? Everyone blames the contamination on this beach to sewage outflow coming from WLSD, and actually the water does migrate back up this way, and we wanted to see what the source of E. coli were on these beaches. So um, here's a better picture showing you the location of WLSD, the Duluth Boat Club, and ISL is called for Interstate um, Island, and this Interstate Island is a rookery for terns and gulls, okay? Millions and millions of them. Okay. So we went ahead and bisected this beach into various different areas and determined what organisms were present. And depending on what time of the year, it's due to wildlife, birds, and wastewater. Okay. So it's not just the sewage treatment facility's fault, but there's other input sources of E. coli present. So where have all these bacteria coming from? Well, they come from these guys. And you don't need a lot of sophisticated technology. You can use these right here and you can see where some of these organisms are coming from. So they come from Canadian geese, they come from birds, terns, and gulls, they come from pets, and the most dangerous creature of all, this little baby. <laughs> Which, well, people bring their babies into the water, and they pull out this 300-pound baby with a socking wet diaper, and then they wonder where the bacteria come from. Okay. So we also follow over time these organisms, and we could find Canadian geese, mallard duck, ring-billed gulls, and wastewater actually contributing a relatively small portion to the total loading. Right? So those are two sources now, soil and sand. We're also interested in looking at other sources for E. coli, and we focus attention on this organism here, which is a macrophytic alga called Cladophora. And for those of you who have ever spent the summer on Lake Michigan or any other Great Lakes except Lake Superior, you will find the shore covered with this stuff. Okay? And this work's done in collaboration with Richard Whitman and Murley Biopanali at the USGS site. 
So we do most of our work at the southern tip of Lake Michigan, and this is a really nasty spot. Okay, this is where um, Indiana Dunes um, National Lakeshore and Ogden Dunes Park come in. This is the little Calumet River that runs from Indiana this way. This is a really nasty spot. We call this side of the lake the clean side of the lake, and this side the dirty side of the lake. And if you looked at an aerial photograph of this, it would become very obvious because the water coming out of here is black in color. So we followed over time the organisms that are present in Kladaf are isolated from those ditches, and you find these astounding numbers of E. coli. So we're at, I can't even read the number here, are we at 10 to the 6th? 10 to the 5th per gram on the ditch side, around 10 to the 4th or so on the lake side of E. coli per gram of algae. So there's little kids playing in this stuff on the beach, okay? In addition, not only do we find E. coli associated with the algae, we also find Campylobacter and Salmonella associated with this algae. We again use DNA fingerprinting, RET-PCR, with the box primer to look at the genotypic distribution of Salmonella found on Clodophora and Campylobacteria, and it should be very obvious to you that these organisms are monogenotypic. This is the same strain found on, Sal on Clodophora no matter where you go in the lake. Okay. Whereas Campylobacter varies a lot. So we followed actually the growth of Salmonella in Lake Michigan over time, and interestingly, every year the population changes of Salmonella. And the reason why this is monogenotypic is because this organism survived best during that summer season, where other types follow best other parts of the year. And by the way, this is the Newport variety of Salmonella. It's pretty nasty. Okay? Again, little kids are playing in this stuff. All right. Are there other sources of E. coli in the environment that we do not know about? Well, everyone says E. coli is present in the intestinal tract of warm-blooded animals. How about cow-blooded animals? So this was great. We had a graduate student whose main hobby was to fish. So we handed him a fishing rod, a fishing license, and some worms, and said, go catch some fish. So he went out and caught some fish, and he caught bullheads, and he caught um, catfish. And we essentially looked at fish that were located in the upper parts of the water column, those in the middle of the water column, and those bottom feeders. And what we find is E. coli populations in all those fish, and of course the most were found in the bottom feeders that are eating on detritus where E. coli is growing. So yes, there are E. coli in fish, but we look at them as more as a transport medium, dropping E. coli at different spots throughout the lake as they move around and defecate. That was a very polite word. Okay. <laughs> all right. So we've also looked at the population structure of E. coli and many other spots, and our state is particularly interested in their survival in creeks and streams. Again, getting back to what Don says, we have to try to correlate the survivability of these organisms to other marker systems. So we've been looking at this place called Seven Mile Creek in southern Minnesota. It's essentially a man-made ditch, or I guess that's not politically correct, a person-made ditch, all right, where all these tile drains feed into it, and then the question is, does E. coli always present in this ditch? Where are those E. coli coming from? Do they grow in the ditch? Do they grow in the sediment? And so forth. So we've looked at this. Oh, sorry. It's uh, mostly agricultural sites. And we start up here, SM4, SM3, SM2, and SM1. The um, Minnesota rivers down here, hydraulically, water moves in this direction. Okay. So I'm not going to show you all the results of this study. But um, we had 606 different E. coli strains were detected, and 356 of these strains were represented by a single isolate. So there was input of E. coli coming into this river, into this creek. The remaining isolates, however, 250 of them, had between 2 and 112 representatives. So the most likely is growth of these organisms present in this particular waterway. The interesting part of this, again, was we found some isolates that were the same genotypically, so they were most likely growing, and these were clonal isolates. And the other cool part of this study is we had a drought that year. And each site became separated from each other site and became geographically isolated. So we can follow the individual populations multiplying in each one of those sites, and then we can look at the interplay between those in the sediment and those in the water, and we can see those changing back and forth over time. 
And then at the end of the season, we had a nice rain and started mixing stuff together, and we could see the movement of this genotype from this site to that site. So it was a really cool study to do. Now, we've heard a lot about library-dependent and library-independent methods. Right? And I want to tell you about another, other t another type of microbial source tracking that we have um, developed over the last several years in collaboration with some folks in Korea. Now, we know that there's limitations of library-dependent me methods, and there's also limitations to library independence that you heard today, including inherent problems with qPCR, the presence of inhibitors, and the limited number of host source specific DNA markers that we can use. We know that the plate count and qPCR data severely limit what we can see, and the questions we ask, can metagenomics save the day? And these were done with collaborations with actually my first PhD student and his first PhD student. Okay. So what is metagenomics? Essentially, it's the study of all the DNA that's in an environmental sample, regardless of its origin. Okay. There's different types of metagenomic studies that can be done. You can use 16S analyses to define microbial diversity. You could do microbial community analyses or functional gene discovery analyses. And this, for example, is what they use to discover new enzymes for laundry detergents and so forth and so on. Now, why do we use metagenomics? It basically boils down to one major factor in that we can pr pretty much assure to grow less than 1% of every organism that's in an environmental sample. And actually, to hit this even home even more, the presence of E. coli in your intestinal tract, although it's been used as a fecal indicator organism for a long time, it represents less than 1% of the fecal, of the bacteria in your intestine. In fact, in most metagenome studies, you can't even find E. coli. Okay. All right, so how do we do this? Well, there's two standard ways of doing this. One is to take a water sample, and this is a site on the Mississippi River up at the beginning of the Mississippi at Lake Itasca. You isolate the total DNA from that sample. You can either clone the DNA into a vector, making a clone library, which we don't do very much anymore, but now we directly sequence the DNA. And what really helps us is this new high throughput, large scale, inexpensive DNA sequencing technology. And I'll tell this to Don in a second. Initially we used a platform called 454 that produced about 700,000 DNA sequences in a week with a length of about 500 base pairs. And it cost $13,000 to run that, and we can do 12 samples on that analysis. Okay? We now use the Illumina platform, which is um, another company's uh, product. It produces, this is wrong, 170 million reads at 100 base pair length and we can run 80 samples for $3,000, okay? So the price has dropped a lot. So this first technology, 454, was called Next Generation Sequencing Technology. The aluminum platform that does 170 million sequences is called Next Next Generation Technology, right? And now Next Next Generation Technology is trash. You could throw that out too because now there's a new generation technology that it can sequence even faster and more inexpensively. Right? These sequence analyses take about a week to do. We have a new machine now that will do a sequencing in a day and give five million sequences for $1,000. Okay? So we can do 24 samples for $1,000 on these machines and get the data back in one day. So why is it useful? Well, what we're focusing on in my lab, on this tree of life, is really the bacteria which represent this very large group of organisms that most of us are studying. And the methods we use is quite simple. We extract fecal DNA from a large number of animal hosts. And typically, what we do is we'll get 10 chickens, 10 cows, 10 geese, or 20 cows, 20 geese, what have you, and pool all that poop together in one tube. We homogenize it really well, then extract the DNA sample, and then we sequence all that DNA. Then we go into the environment and collect a water sample, either very large quantities like 40 liters or very small quantities like one liter, isolate the DNA from those samples, and then see whether there's a match between these DNA sequences that are present. So this library-dependent method is a lot different than we're used to using because instead of looking at 200 or 1,000 organisms in our library, we're now looking at tens or hundreds of thousands of organisms in a library and asking whether we can match those up together. 
So the flow of the sample is simple. You take the sample, you extract the DNA. We amplify the 16S ribosomal DNA using straight PCR. And then we sequence the PCR products. And we produce hundreds of millions of DNA sequences. And then the overall goal sounds easy. You just match the sequences in the data set to those in the environmental sample. But that can be done in one or two ways. In one way, we can look at shared taxonomic units, for example, genre or family of microorganisms. The other way is to forget about what the organism is called, just look at its DNA sequence. That's called an OTU or op operational taxonomic unit. I don't care what you call this thing, it's just here in this sample and it's here in this waterway, so they're related. Okay. So essentially, these shared OTUs are just DNA sequences that align together over time. And then you can do these network diagrams that show you where the shared OTUs are between water samples or your DNA samples that came from animals. So we've put, published a couple of papers on this. Uh, one is Environmental Science and Technology in 2010 on using barcoded DNA sequences to determine sources of fecal bacteria. Now, barcoding is an awesome technology. Barcoding allows you to pool all your samples together in one tube, sequence them all, and then sort them out later. A barcode is simply six nucleotides. Right? And we have approximately 100 variations on those six nucleotides that we can attach to each DNA sample from each watershed or animal source. We can pull them all together, get the sequence back, and then let bioinformatics separate out all these barcodes into different bins so we know which sample came from what. And that way we can sequence 80 organisms or 80 samples at the same time. Okay. So using this technology, we were able to look at watersheds to see what the dominant contributors are or is to the fecal contamination. And we looked at urban areas, and in urban areas we see a large domination of human markers. In open areas between urban and agricultural, we find a lot of wildlife, such as geese. Or, um, and then in agricultural areas, we saw a big dominance by pigs. Okay. So the big issue in this technology is not whether you can do it and how much money you have, but do you have a way to analyze the data? So every time a data set comes back to my lab, it's 170 million DNA sequences. You cannot just look at spreadsheets or Excel and figure out what's going on. Okay? We're fortunate at our university have the Minnesota Supercomputing Institute that allows us to upload a lot of our data to those databases to look at them. And the other thing you need to have is a platform that allows you to upload 100 million sequences at one time and not do blast search at one at a time. Right? Your grad students would die before they finish this. Okay? <laughs> so biotechnology really helps us here. So to help people use this technology, we've developed a web-based platform where you can simply go ahead, isolate a DNA from a water sample, and upload it to our database, this automated microbial source tracking system that is online in Korea and online here at the University of Minnesota. We are expanding our database to ask the big $650 million question of regionality of DNA fingerprints, and we're asking people in this room and elsewhere to donate DNA to us or donate poop to us from their animal sources so we can combine those together into one master large U.S. database. Okay. So if you have any extra poop at home, please send it to us. Okay. All right. So this next generation fecal taxonomic libraries, we're calling FTLs, and they contain all the taxonomic unit and OTUs and pooled fecal samples for known animal sources. And this not only gives you information about a single organism, but it gives you the information about all the organisms that are present in the sample, including pathogens and commensal and fecal bacteria and everything else that's present. So rather than getting a small snapshot of Bacteroides or Enterococcus or E. coli, you can get a very large view of all the organisms that are in that environment or in that animal. So we're currently doing this project on a large scale. and We had funding from the state of Minnesota um, to look at the metagenomics of the Mississippi River. 
So the Mississippi River starts up here at Lake Itasca in northern, uh, western Minnesota, and then travels down through the Twin Cities, and we've taken samples twice a year at multiple depths, at a, and at some sites multiple times a year, to look what's making up the constituents of the Mississippi River. And it's very interesting to follow the influence of the confluencies of other rivers and up and downstream from sewage treatment plants to see how that impacts the water microbiology of the Mississippi. So these pyro sequencing runs that we're doing really allows you to look at 200 samples per aluminum run, and therefore it costs about $25 a sample. So it's fairly inexpensive technology, and the price is dropping as we talk now. And DNA sequencing technology is following Moore's law, the same way that computers have followed over the years, and the price keeps dropping and dropping and dropping. And what's kind of not good is if you're buying this equipment, it becomes obsolete the day you purchase it, okay? <laughs> and then the price drops tremendously, and you can't even give the stuff away. But the good thing about it is the new machines, just like your new computers now cost $300, are dropping in price a lot too. And there's going to be a desktop model they predict out next year that costs $45,000, where you put your own sample in it, hit a button, walk away, and that's it. And it will sequence everything in that sample for you. Right. So um, let me just finish up now. So um, I'm running out of time, but I'd like to say um, that if you'd like to find more information about how we do E. coli rep DNA fingerprinting, I'd like to point you to our website. Um, there's a lot of information on how to process a lot of samples rapidly. There's project overviews, there's methods, and there's links. And for those of you who are really sick and want some good bedtime reading, <laughs> you can pick up this book that we published last year by ASM Press called The Fecal Bacteria. And there's so many people to acknowledge in here, um, both students, postdocs, uh, professors and a lot of funding sources and without their uh, generous contributions I couldn't be up here talking. So with that I'd like to thank you and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Excellent.